and welcome back for another essential dose of the Michael Deacon program. I know you couldn't stay away for too long. I don't blame you. First time listeners out there, thanks for stopping in. The pleasure is all yours. We do hope you stick around and subscribe. This is where gold falls from the sky. Tonight we are joined by a longtime veteran here of the program, Mr. Michael Cremo. And I believe he is patiently waiting right now. And yes, we are a little late. But that happens every now and then. Let's bring in Mr. Michael Cremo. And I believe Mike is here with us too. Mike, are you out there? Uh, Mike Hideous? Yes, I'm there here. There you are, brother. Hold on Hi, one Mike. second. Let's bring in Mr. Cremo, who is patiently waiting. Michael, how are you? Or did we lose you already? Mr. Cremo? Mr. Cremo, how are you? I'm doing fine here in Los Angeles. How are you? I always forget that you are in Los Angeles, Michael. I always forget for some odd reason. Uh, Mr. Cremo, so how are you? Thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you here on the program, by the way. Well, you know, like, like everybody else, I'm kind of living under restricted conditions because of the COVID thing. And I'm kind of looking forward to being able to resume what I consider to be my normal life which it did include a lot of travel. Right. Yeah, and I sincerely hope all is going well for you out there in Los Angeles. It's been a very chaotic year. The world has changed, and it continues to do so, Mr. Cremo. COVID is the new plague. As a, as a result, we are uh, dealing with a nonstop infodemic, as I like to say. And I'm quite intrigued to know your thoughts and opinions on COVID and just the year that we experienced already, sir? Well, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's an experience and I'm still trying to digest it. And one of, one of the first things I, I did when this whole thing came on, it came on for me, I mean, last February I had gone on a trip to India where I spend a lot of time doing research, right. talks and things like that. And you know, I came back to, to, to LA and you know, I walked into a Trader Joe's and the, I was just amazed. I couldn't, I'd never seen anything like it. All the, all the uh, shelves were stripped bare of everything, you know, water, bread, anything. You know, and, you know, there were hundreds of people in there, you know, scraping up whatever was left. And you know, I, I, I had just never seen anything like that. So the first, one of the first things I did is I went back to Albert Camus' book, uh, The Plague. He's a kind of an existentialist author, philosopher, thinker. And it was pretty amazing. So uh, I still haven't finished processing the whole thing. What it has done is it's given me time to finish up writing projects and things that I put off because sometimes all the activity of traveling, speaking, meeting people, doing research, you, know, you tend to put things on the back burner that really shouldn't be there but it's so much fun doing the other stuff you don't get to it so i was able to finish a book i've been working on for a while it's you know, kind of going through proofreading and editing now and hopefully it'll be out later later this year i'm calling it extreme human antiquity so nice. Okay. So, so that that's been a you know a more positive aspect of the whole thing. Right. So, you came back to Los Angeles and things were uh, just insane. In other words, I think we were all shocked yeah, when we yeah. walked into the stores. Oh yeah, interesting. I had no idea you would learn of uh, COVID in in such a way. Uh, hmm. 
And I'm sure it's it's really put a um, dent in your momentum, Michael, since I know you do travel around a lot. And of course, Michael, I have to ask you, will you be getting the vaccine, sir? Um, uh, if, you know, if it's going to prevent me from doing what I need to do, I, I would, would do it. You might have to, uh, you, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, everyone has to calculate the risk and the benefits for it. You know, it, I mean, up to this point, nobody said it's mandatory, but you kind of get the idea that that's the, the way things are moving. And you know, for certain certain activities, you know, to be able to enter different countries or you know attend certain events, maybe it's going to be something that's required. But oh yes, and I understand that different people can have principles differences of opinion about whether or not to take them, what the risks are. But then, in my personal case, calculating the risks uh, and benefits, you know, and you know, considering you know, my age, my position, everything, everything, I probably would take it. Yes. I think it might be a good thing for you, Michael. But uh, I, I understand it's not without risk. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, do you, m m Mr. Cremo, do you have reservations concerning the vaccine at all? Oh, oh, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think there is. Yeah, when, when they were first announced. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. Yeah. Like I saw, like the letter you know, or form that you have to sign and it says these haven't got these are being used under emergency circumstances in other words they haven't undergone the full testing the full procedure for you know approving things like that that's right at the top of the paper you know this this is being used or, or administered on the basis of an emergency uh, license or something from the CDC or whatever organization handles it. So, uh, yeah. At, at so you, def time, you definitely uh, have some reservations concerning it, but you are still you still are considering getting the shot, uh, even if it's not mandatory at, at this point right now. It may be, like you said, there's a chance they may push it to be mandatory. But right now, you feel that you you based on what you said before, you feel that it's probably a necessity for you to get the shot, right? Uh, it seems like that, and the thing is that if uh, you know, once you decide to get it, if, if you don't get the, the single shot one, it takes like five or six weeks for you to get both shots and immunity. And you know, then, you know, say if you want to do something, if suddenly something came up, some opportunity and you could go somewhere, but it requires you know, some countries they may require require it that you know you can enter if you have a vaccine or something like that. Right. Then I'd like to be ready. Oh yeah. And not have to start the process and wait six weeks or something before being able to go. I mean. Like a few years ago, I had I had an opportunity to go to China to a, a science conference in China, so I went to Beijing. But before I had before I could go, I had to get uh, I had to get a yellow fever 
vaccine, vaccination. Yeah, you know, I, I don't like vaccinations personally. I, I don't like people poking needles into me and stuff like that. But I don't think anyone does. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it just may be part of the price one has to pay to function in the world we live in. But but I can understand that there are people who based on their calculations, think it's not an acceptable risk and would avoid it and try to convince other people to avoid it as well. I don't even mind it, to be honest, uh, Mr. Cremo. Uh, the fact that I don't, um, I'm not out and about. You know, I could order anything I want and I'll be fine. I don't even like standing in line, Mr. Cremo. I always hated that. Mm -hmm. Michael's a bit of a hermit. That's true. And I also noticed, Mr. Cremo, I'm not as sick as I used to be. That's another plus. I'm not... Not as what? I'm not... I don't get as sick as I normally oh, do. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. It's it's tremendous because I hated getting sick, Mr. Cremo. So, you know, I'm quite happy for the first time. I'm not uh, dying of a cold or uh, my nose isn't, isn't stuffy where I want to, you know, ram my head into the floor Everything's fine. Well, may that continue. I hope. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if the vaccine is going to harm me, then what's the point of taking it? But then again, you know, I'm not a doctor or a health expert. I would have to advise everyone out there listening to check in with their health advisor uh, before you think about getting the vaccine. Or um, if you have to, you know, some people will be required to be vaccinated for their job. That's another thing, too. Yeah. So Tremendous sort of, times. It is sort of mandatory. In, in some sense of the matter, it is sort of mandatory for certain individuals to get it. I think the big question is whether or not it's going to become publicly uh, mandatory. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but... You know what I mean? Like, like everybody has to get yeah. it. If you Mandated, to, right. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You want to go to a theater or, or uh, a concert or, or travel, like Mr. Cremo, Cremo said. Uh, so it, a lot of controversy in this thing. Yeah. People are, are rather confused. We will see what goes on as we move forward. And uh, Mr. Cremo, as we get started here, I... I believe the, the couple of times I've talked to you, you mentioned you had a Roman Catholic sort of upbringing, correct? Yes, I, I was born in a Roman Catholic family. My grandparents came from, yeah, on both my mother's and father's side, came from Italy in late 19th century or early 20th century. So they were kind of our first generation of our family. And of course, they were from Italy. They were grown people. They spoke Italian. And then there was my father's and mother's generation. You know, they were kind of second generation Italian-Americans. And some second generation Italian-Americans, they kind of stayed in the neighborhood, the ethnic neighborhood. And you know, retained a lot of knowledge of Italian and things like that. But uh, some of them, like my father, during World War II, he went into the military, the Army Air Force, and later the, converted into the Air Force, United States Air Force. So his career kind of took him out of the neighborhood and you know, into the wider world. And yeah, then I was, you know, third generation, so I was, I mean, I knew the family had an Italian uh, Catholic heritage, and, you know, I did go to Catholic church, not to the Catholic schools. I went to the schools on the air bases, in different places where I lived, so... Yeah, I, I did kind of grow up in, in that tradition. And um, I didn't really reject it or anything, but I 
just maybe uh, tried to develop my spirituality in a in a different direction. Right. Yeah, that I found more satisfying. I became the disciple of a guru from India. I found you know, yoga, meditation, things like that. Yes. Very, Congenial for me. We could even yeah, talk about diet. Mr. Creamer, we could even talk about your life for hours here on end. I, I think you've lived an incredible and fascinating life. Uh, you've traveled the world. You've done it all. And Mr. Cremo, I must ask you, uh, as a result of this upbringing you had, do you think that sort of resulted? Uh, as a result, do you think that that's why you sort of became? Uh, so entranced with this other sort of view opposed to Catholicism. I mean, you're kind of on the opposite spectrum here now. Well, I I don't consider it that I'm opposed. Yeah, that was probably not the right choice of words. Catholicism. Yes. But, you know, in every religious tradition that I'm familiar with, you've got a more exoteric and a more esoteric aspect to it. So there's the aspect of Catholicism that has to do with, you know, they also had a system of meditation, contemplation, prayer, the monastic life, the mystical, you know, the, the uh, Catholic mystics, uh, you know, things like that. So that that's one aspect. I'm very was just, I'm kind of very attracted to that aspect of it. But then there's a more external aspect to it. You know, you you know, you just follow some rituals and uh recite your catechism and things like that. Mm, and yes. I'm not saying that's bad. Sure. But some people I think it's good for people, but yeah, you know, then there's the aspect of, like I said, the more mystical, contemplative aspect of things. And I found uh, I had a better experience of that with this Eastern tradition. But I, 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 I remember once I had gone some when I was younger, when I was in my twenties, I'd gone to Europe, and then I went to Israel. Yeah, I'm not Jewish, but I you know, went there, and you know, I'm born in Italian Roman Catholic. Oh, they, but yes. I, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I went there to work on a kibbutz, just for the experience. And it was winter time, maybe 1969. So I went to uh, Bethlehem, yeah, we got some time off from our, yeah, I was with some other young people from America and Europe, and we were working at this kibbutz, as they called it, you know, like a, uh, kind of like a, we were picking oranges, actually, that's what we did on that kibbutz. But, you know, we went to the group of, you know, Europeans and Westerners, we went to Bethlehem for Christmas time. And because there had been a war there recently in 1967, there were no tourists in Bethlehem. And you know, we went to the Church of the Nativity. We kind of went down into this crypt where they have the actual place where uh, Christ was born. And yeah, there were the only people there were the, there were these maybe six or seven nuns from Belgium, and they were singing these Latin prayers you know, about Christmas and the appearance of uh, Christ and Virgin Mary and Joseph and all of that. And I had a real spiritual feeling there. Because in 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 America, you know, Christmas is just kind of like a this marathon of shopping and consuming and this and that. Oh yeah, and it's very it's become very materialistic 
for commercial yeah, the, the yes. biggest thing is did, did sales did retail sales go up how much this year you know yeah that's what it's all so about the, yeah sure they start advertising for Christmas in August <laughs> yeah yeah, it's just a kind of like a commercial festival, but you know, so to have that experience of being at the birthplace of Christ in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve, you know, that was, and to be in the exact place where it happened. That, that was kind of an amazing uh, right. experience. So, um, mm. I, in, either in terms of religion or science or whatever topic we're talking about, I don't really uh, agree that anyone has a monopoly on truth, whatever it is. Interesting. You know, yeah. Because I think that's one of the uh, big problems that the world is facing. You know, our country is facing, the world is facing. You know, there are people with exclusive claims. I'm the only one right. My people, my religion, my country, my. We're the only ones who are right, and everybody else is. Wrong. wrong yeah i'm so glad you oh, said yeah. that mr cremo it's funny uh because you know i've been saying that uh non-stop here on the program that uh everyone everyone thinks they're right and no one's wrong that's kind of one of the main issues that we have here in america everyone's right and uh, no one's ever wrong mr cremo so it's funny you say that go ahead mike i'm sorry i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you michael i i just wanted to say you know since we're on the subject it's i mean the the religions that the three main religions have been at war for over a thousand years more than a thousand years there's been nothing but fighting between judeo-christian or, or i should say christian the jewish faith faith and and islam they've been fighting e even the jews had been fighting before the time of christ and um so you've you've just got this constant barrage of groups of people saying my god is better than your god and because of that we're going to come and we're going to cut everybody's head off in the name of god and that really disturbs me about mainstream religion yeah i yeah in one sense i think america has in theory the right idea you know um uh, everyone should be Free. I mean, assuming they're not harming somebody else, you know, Absolutely. in a criminal way. Yeah, everyone has the right to believe in God or take this faith or that faith. And, you know, the minorities actually have rights and, you know, should be defended. I think it has the right idea in theory. It's just that in practice, it, it it doesn't always work out that way, and you know, like you you get you know, some conflict as a result of that. But in theory, I think the United States and other countries have you know the right idea. Yeah, you know, there shouldn't be a state religion. There should be freedom of conscience, freedom of choice. That's right. And you know, that's, I mean, I, I think that's a, a wonderful ideal. And, but I think the, the, basis, the real basis way. of hmm? I was going to say, unfortunately, not everyone thinks that way. And there, I mean, we've interviewed other, other gentlemen who have come on the program who are, you know, hardcore Christian uh, believers or Catholic believers. Um, and they, they, are stern on their belief and when they say that everyone else is wrong and what I believe in is right. And in some cases, even their their whole ide ideology is based on what they've come up with, not something that the religion has been based on for the last 2,000 years or 5,000 years. 
like they come up with new ideas and then they incorporate it into this, you know, ideology and say, well, this is what's going to happen and everybody else is wrong. There's a couple of people that Michael and I have both interviewed and a few Michael has done on his own. And, and the, some people are just hell bent, pardon the pun. Uh, they're hell bent on, on, on believing that their way is the only way. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think the, I mean, one solution to that, which may be in some ways not always practical, but as if it, it would be like, say you have gold and, you know, it's in an ore. So an expert geologist or metallurgist will know how to extract the gold. And then you could form the gold into coins. And then you could stamp the symbols of different nations on the coins. You know, South Africa, Rand, U.S. gold dollar, British pound, or gold. You, know, you could have gold coins stamped with the symbols of different nations. Now, the real question is, is it gold or not? If it's gold, then it doesn't matter what symbol that you've stamped on it. Now, if it's really gold, it should be accepted as such. Uh, you shouldn't just look at the symbol on it. I think it's the same with religion. So if, you, if you've actually developed some spiritual qualities, some understanding that we're all children of the same God, you know, and you, it, it's reflected in your life how you deal with people. If you've got that, then I think it doesn't matter what you call the system that you got it from, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Uh, there's, so many, there's so many different faith manifestations. But if you got that understanding, yeah, there, there is a, a source of us all, and we're all related to it. And, you know, I, 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 I think that would help solve things. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much to say, but we will move forward here uh, from religion, but we, I'm sure we will get uh, placed right back into religion. <laughs> Um, as we continue this conversation, but um, uh, Mr. Cremo, I must ask you, as a member of, I believe, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Krishna Consciousness. yeah, would you recommend uh, this group uh, to anyone out there who is still, I guess, trying to find themselves on their spiritual journey, per se, Mr. Cremo? Well, I think it's something they should definitely consider. Yeah, I mean, everyone has to make up their own minds about these things. Like, if you're going to get a smartphone, I mean, there's so many types of phones: Samsung, <laughs> and Apple. I like and that. Yeah. This and that. <laughs> good, good analogy. <laughs> you, you got to pick one. Okay, pick one, and live with the result. You know, like. That's uh, so. I I did the same thing. There were a lot of options for me. Uh, like when you go into that uh, marketplace, you know, of ideas and spiritual traditions and things. There are lots of options out there. I studied the options. I experienced them, I, uh, and I made my choice. And one of the reasons why I made the choice was that it, it had this sort of non-sectarian aspect to it in the sense that, you know, my guru or teacher, you know, he, would, he would often say, you know, it, like the sun is shining in the sky. And you may call it this or that according to your language, but it's still the same sun shining in everybody. So 
the question of my son, your son, an American son, a French son, a Russian or Chinese son, shining on everybody. You know, so God is the same. You know, he's the creator of everything, everyone. You know, so it, it, if you're developing love for God, love for all God's creatures, then it doesn't matter if you call yourself Christian or Hindu or Islamic or Buddhist or whatever. If you have the you know, right attitude, then that's that, so that's one thing that kind of attracted me to it. Um, but as I said, I, I don't claim to have a monopoly on truth or spirituality. Uh, I try to recognize it wherever I see it, recognize it, acknowledge it. And people of all different faiths who are sincerely trying to understand these things and uh, so I I could recommend it as definitely an option that could be considered by someone who is searching for a spiritual path. Right. And Mr. Cremo, I must ask you, once you fully went deep down, uh, what did your mom and dad initially think that they think you went crazy my son now became a hippie <laughs> is that what they thought at first mr cremo i'm very uh, curious that that that's to some extent true or uh yeah because you know some that that, that can happen although i of course my not that my mother and father are still living, but you know, they, um, there was some reconciliation. Yes, you could say some understanding that that came about. But basically, my motivations were. I mean, I've always since since I've been born, ever since I can remember, or maybe even before I was born in this lifetime, I've always been interested in, I have these core values or ambitions. And one is the, the ability to express myself right. freely. The ability just to exist. You know, that I'm a person, I exist, I have a right to exist, I have, I want to be able to express myself, I want to be able to understand the real truth about things, not the superficial appearances, but what the real truth about life and the world and the universe is. I've always had that. I've always had a sense of justice and fairness. I've also had a sense of wanting the, to understand the nature of love. Right. What is true love? What is... So those have always been my ambitions, to know things, to know what the truth is about different topics, to be free to express myself, to be able to express what I'm feeling and thinking to others if they're willing to listen. And you know, the nature of love, ultimately. So uh, I've been able, in the course of my life, to make some progress on those things or to be able to live in a way that I have felt is consistent with those values and objectives and goals that I've always had. Understood. And of course, Mr. Cremo, I think everyone is quite familiar with the NBC special, The Mysterious Origins of Man, that was first aired uh, back in 1996, I believe. And um, 
Yes, I, they were alive at the time. Right. Probably about half the world has taken birth since then. Exactly, and I watched it years ago, and I enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I watched it just this week, and I still enjoyed it all all these years later. Yeah, I, I, I think at least the, the contribution that I made and my co-author, Richard Thompson, Richard Thompson, co-author of Forbidden Archaeology, made, I think it stands up even 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 today. Yeah, that, that was... Uh, <clears throat> It was kind of interesting how that came about, my involvement in that project. You know, uh, <clears throat> my book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology, excuse me, let's take a little bit of water here. Go ahead, drink away. Clear your so, throat there. <clears throat> uh, my, my book, Forbidden Archaeology, came out in 1993, and it came into the hands of a, a lot of different people. One person was a lady named Jean Hunt, who lived in Louisiana, the elderly person at the time. And, you know, she was president of a little organization called the Louisiana Mount Society. So uh, she was interested in my book, Forbidden Archaeology, which documents evidence that humans like us have been existing for far longer periods of time than most scientists now accept. You know, there's actual archaeological evidence for humans existing millions and millions of years ago. But uh, you know, she got the book and she called me on the phone, and she had a wonderful Southern accent. She said, "Michael, I read your book. I really like it." And this, you should send a copy of it to Bill Cote, who's a television producer in New York City. So I got his contact information from her, and I sent Bill Cote the book, Forbidden Archaeology. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of making a, or pitching a, a proposal for a documentary called The Mysterious Origins of Man. To NBC, and what you've written here fits perfectly into it. You know, so uh, he came out and with his film crew and interviewed myself and Richard Thompson, who was my co-author on Forbidden Archaeology. And then uh, when that program aired on a Sunday evening, uh, one in prime time on the NBC television network, it caused a nationwide sensation. Oh yes! You know the, the scientific community was screaming, "How could you?" you know, they tried to organize a boycott of NBC. They tried to get the uh, what is the federal organization? The that, FCC. Federal Communications Commission. Right. The FCC. They tried to get the FCC to censure and fine NBC for having shown this documentary. <laughs> That's funny. So it really, it, you know, it, it, it really made a stir at the time, and it's still echoing today. May, may I ask a question? Um, sure. Can you just tell some of our listeners who are, who may not be familiar with with the uh, the book that you wrote a, a little bit about what caused so much of the controversy uh, on the basis of the book? Well, the controversy is most scientists today think that humans like us first appeared on this planet less than 300,000 years ago. Actually, at the time the book was written, they, they were saying less than 100,000 years ago. And in the early 2000s, they said 200,000 years ago. And now they're saying 300,000 years ago. They said before that, there weren't any humans like us. Uh, there were just more primitive ape-like human ancestors like uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the 
Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Australopithecus, and eventually, yes, some primitive apes and monkeys. So uh, that is in all the textbooks in every school in the United States and practically every other country around the world. So what I showed in Forbidden Archaeology is actually in the textbooks today, we're not getting the complete set of facts. You know, if you actually look, as I did, into the whole history of archaeology, you'll find that archaeologists, geologists, paleontologists, and other scientists digging into the earth have found hundreds of examples of human bones, human artifacts, and human footprints millions of years old. But because this evidence doesn't fit the dominant paradigm, you know, the dominant consensus in science today, that they're filtered out. These discoveries simply aren't mentioned anymore, although they're there in the original scientific, scientific li literature. So I think there's a process of knowledge filtration that, that goes on in, in the, the world of science. Right. There's lots of controversy surrounding what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, you find out later if you look into the Smithsonian. And uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Cremo, I must ask you, and I think I've asked you this before, were you close friends with um, Richard by any chance? Um, for many years, yes. Uh, we worked together. It, it, the, the, he was like, he was a, a co-religionist. He's, he's a member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Right. And he was involved in uh, Bhaktivedanta Institute, which was the science studies branch of that society. He was one of its founding members. And he was, uh, so he was uh, like my mentor. Oh, okay, in, I see science and Krishna consciousness. And we worked together to make a, the first project that we worked on together was uh, uh, a magazine style publication about 64 pages long that gave our basic positions on all the major scientific questions like the origin of the universe, the origin of consciousness, the origin of the first living thing, the origin of species, including the human species, and so on. So we put that publication together, and then we decided to take each section of the magazine and turn it into a book. And he gave me the archaeology, the human origins section to work on. So, so I spent eight years doing the research and writing uh, under his direction and supervision of the book, you know, that became Forbidden Archaeology. So uh, I would say for a period of at least 10, 10 or 15 years, we worked uh, very closely together. Ah, oh, I see. Um, yes, you guys were actually. Yeah, then you guys were uh, close friends. And the only reason why I ask is because sometimes people put out these books, and you have these co-authors, and these two individuals don't actually even know each other. There, there's no like no real history there. Yeah, I think in my introduction to the book Forbidden Archaeology, I kind of explained what our relationship was and the different contributions we each made to the uh, writing of that book. So I, I, I've explained that in, in the introduction, the, the nature of our relationship. Yes, sir. And of course, we mentioned the criticism that you received, severe criticism from both uh, advocates 
for both sides. And of course, it's very well known that Ken Ham, also someone that you caught the attention of very early on, Mr. Cremo. Yes. Um, but the reaction wasn't all negative. There were some grudging acknowledgement of some positive aspects of the book you know, from some scholars. I would say within the academic and scientific world, there were three basic groups that reacted to uh, forbidden archaeology. And one thing to consider is to get any reaction at all, positive or negative, is pretty amazing. Yeah, because one thing they can do is just ignore something. Absolutely. If it can't be ignored, then you have to criticize. And then, But I, I, I found basically three groups. There, there's one group that I call the fundamentalist materialist or the fun, fundamentalist Darwinist. And they're kind of against the book and everything that it represents. You know, they, but, but for more or less ideological reasons, not for purely scientific reasons, but because of some prior commitment they have to atheism or materialism or whatever. So they didn't want to hear about it, didn't want anybody else to hear about it. If I was scheduled to give a, a lecture at a university, they try to get it canceled. Uh, so that's one group. Then there was another group, a bigger group, I, I would say, that accepted the current Darwinian theory of evolution, but for more or less scientific reasons, which meant they were willing to listen to alternatives. And I think that's important because if ideas are going to change, the very first requirement is that people be willing to listen to a new idea or new evidence. And it's people in that group who were inviting me to give talks at universities, who were uh, approving, accepting papers that I submitted for presentation at major international scientific conferences like meetings of the World Archaeological Congress, for example, or they would invite me to speak at leading scientific institutions like the Royal Institution in Russia, the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, and many others. So then there's a small group of academics and scientists who actually agreed with me, and they're small in number. I admit that. Yeah, those, so, yeah, basically those three kinds of reactions. Right. Right. That must have been a wild time for you, Mr. Cremo. It's 1996. Your special just ran on NBC. You must have been quite thrilled right after that, Mr. Cremo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, I had a plan right from the beginning, even when I was writing the book and before it came out, I knew that forbidden archaeology would cause controversy in the academic and scientific world. So I sent it out for a review to all the major scientific publications, journals uh, that deal with archaeology and human origin and history of science. And and there was a response. And my plan was, and this actually happened, but then to bring out a shorter edition of the book. Because Forbidden Archaeology is 900 pages long, and it's directed towards an academic audience, really. Uh, although even people who aren't academics have bought thousands and thousands of copies. Of right. It. But we brought out a shorter edition, a first edition, about 300 pages long, titled The Hidden History of the Human Race. And we use even you know, the negative quotes, we put them on the book 
along with some positive quotes from Good job. Some scientists. Yeah, I like that. And it uh, kind of took off. You know, I, I started getting invited on radio and television shows. And then it started, the book started being picked up by publishers in different countries. Uh, you know, at the present moment, uh, the the book is, has been printed in uh, 26 different languages, including Chinese. That's wild. Yeah. Mainland China. You know, it's pretty amazing. It is. I mean, so, in a lot of these countries, I started getting invitations to come on lecture tours there of the universities, you know, be get on national television, yeah. national radio. Mr. Cremo, you, like you, you wrote this book in 1993, and we're still talking about it in 2021. Well, yeah. Wild. Like, an example of that, like there's this uh, science studies professor, uh, his name is William Lynch, and he wrote a book last year in 2020. He called it Minority Report. Mm. And... Many of your listeners will be familiar with that title, Minority Report. It was a story by this author named Dick, uh, and it was turned into a movie with Tom Cruise. You know, it's about how uh, the police in the future, they'll have these kind of like psychics working with them who can see into the future and see who's going to commit a crime in the future. So if three of the, if you've got three of these psychics and at least two of them agree, then the police will pick up that person in the present, although he's not committed any crime yet. Yeah, you know, he he's going to commit it in the future, so they arrest him. <clears throat> but sometimes the person who's arrested will ask to see the report of the one psychic or viewer, whatever they call them, who uh, had the minority report, not the majority report. Right. And so this professor's book was about how minority opinion is treated in the world of science. And he gave me as an example, in 2020, he wrote, in 1993, I met Michael Cremo at a conference and, yeah, about history and philosophy of science. And we talked at that time. And, and then he kind of explained, he spent several pages explaining uh, my approach and what he regarded as the strengths and shortcomings of it. Was this so man like, Russian? Like said, what was this man Russian, by later, the way? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I meant to ask, is this man Russian by any chance? No. He's uh, a, a professor. His name is William Lynch. Oh, okay. I'm just asking. He's, he's at a university in the United States. But uh, 20 years later, 30 years later, he's still talking about about a meeting that he had with me. He's using the book that did in archaeology is kind of a classic example in science studies of a minority opinion. So, hmm. anyways, that, that, that's a very lengthy commentary on your point that, yeah, even though the book's been around for a long time, people are still talking about it. Oh, yes. Like it came out yesterday. Oh, yeah. It's a very fascinating book for those that have not checked it out all these years. Uh, you could still pick it up and still be blown away. And uh, going back into ancient times, Mr. Cremo. Michael, I'm sorry. I, just before you get into that topic, can I, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Okay. Uh, I, I have to ask this. Uh, forgive me for being the devil's advocate, but... You mentioned earlier that you're 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 a believer in religion, and you were pretty much born and raised Roman Catholic. Am I correct in that? That's right. Okay. So when you wrote baptized this book, and confirmed. 
Okay, so when you wrote this book, stating that your belief that it there uh, that humanity started far beyond what science believes um, uh, it, it started from, I'm sure you would agree with me that in the Bible it states uh, in in the Christian and I I'm pretty sure the the Jewish uh, uh, Old Testament that life started. 5,000 years ago with Adam and Eve, who basically were walking the, 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 the earth with dinosaurs at that time, and Adam and Eve populated the whole planet from, from them. So my question to you is, did you, is this something that affects you with your scientific belief? Uh, I mean, how do you t how do you balance this? I mean, obviously, you, you, a lot a lot of people who are religious will believe one thing and one thing only, and science mm -hmm. will believe one thing based on fact and what they can prove factually. So, where do you fall in with the belief of the Bible stating that humanity started about five thousand years ago, where Adam and Eve were walking the earth with dinosaurs? And then coming up with an I idea that humanity started possibly 300,000 years ago or more, maybe a million, who knows? Uh, I believe the evidence for a human presence goes right back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. So I think our universe is not just an accident, we're not just accidental creatures who have evolved by natural selection, but purely material elements in an accidental universe. I think the universe was created by God for a purpose, and that is to uh, deliver or raise the level of spirituality of, of the souls that are in this world and the best vehicle for that is the human body so if the universe is manifested by god's mercy as an opportunity for us to perfect our lives by accepting a spiritual teaching of the Bible in this case, then to me, how I generally relate to people who accept Adam and Eve, because Adam and Eve were manifested in the beginning, they're pretty close to it, and you know, during those days of creation. What I say to people of that persuasion is whether we think the earth is a few thousand years old or a few billion years old then we've been around since the beginning and we didn't evolve from apes and monkeys and you know, we can talk about the age of the earth whether it's thousands of years or 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 few billion years, as I think, we can have that discussion a little bit later on, but at least we agree on these things. Humans have been around since the beginning, and they didn't evolve from apes and monkeys. So that's, that's how I generally relate to that, that question. And I will say there are old Earth creationists who accept a very ancient age for the Earth in Catholicism and other Christian denominations. So so what do you say to an atheist who, who may approach you at one of your conferences or wherever, on the street or something, and, and they ask you, you know, like something like I just asked you where the controversy between what the Bible states and what science st tends to factually believe based on mathematics and science, uh, scientific study? I mean, what do you say to somebody who says, oh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't believe in God and, and I think that science is the, you know, science is the answer. How do you respond to something like that? Well, if that's their honest opinion, then I 
perspective, and you know, I respect the right of each individual to make Fair up enough. their mind about these things. But where where I would draw the line is if they try to force or compel somebody else to accept their opinion and give up theirs. That's kind of where I draw the line, where, uh, you know, like if, if somebody honestly thinks they've looked at the evidence, they've considered it, they've looked at all the different points of views, and for them, atheism is the idea that makes the most sense, and that's their personal conclusion, that's how they want to see things. Fine. Right. Well, Fair Mr. Enough. Cremo, but there's... The, 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 the difficulty comes in when they organize and somehow or other politically they convince government yes. to enforce their idea only and exclude other ideas from the education system or the uh, uh, scientific support from the government. You know, then, then you've got a problem. You know, if, if somebody uses the instrument of government to enforce, enforce under pain of penalty, their idea, you know, over every other idea, to give them a government enforced monopoly, then I've got a problem with that. Right, and Mr. Cremo, some people fully and firmly believe that the Earth is flat, so, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Um, some people will not be convinced otherwise. What a world. Yes. Yes, sir, and well, I, go ahead. Uh, you know, a, a, a lot depends upon, you know, whether ultimately we respect the right of an individual to have, you know, in other words, we talk about it in our Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, like I said, these modern democracies, they tend to have the right idea. Yes, there should be freedom of religion, freedom of speech. You know, government shouldn't impose uh, on it. Uh, you know, there should be separation of church and state. Yes, sir. You know, there was an interesting philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend. You know, he was originally from Germany, but he came to the United States and taught at University of California at Berkeley, I think it was, and Stanford and other places. But he wrote uh, a book called Science in a Free Society. He said, just like he said, that just like there should be separation from church and state, there should be separation of science and state. Well, I don't disagree with you on that. Do you do you think do you? It's so weird to ask you this, but based on on your writings, I mean, to me, it seems that you wrote more scientifically than from a religious aspect. Do you believe one over the other? Do you believe that the Bible, you know, when the Bible states that humanity started 5,000 years ago, do you believe that? Or do you believe more scientifically that humanity may have started 3 million years ago? Well, you know, th there are different interpretations of the Bible. You know, some people give the short days of creation and other people have this long day of creation. You know, so even even within the Christian denominations there's not total agreement on the age of the earth. You know, right. The it, a lot of times the they'll, they'll they'll say that, you know, seven days was, you know, seven million years or something like that, or seven billion years. Yeah, I understand some, that something. part. I, I was just like curious that. from from your point of view as a you know being a Christian, you know having grown up. I'm Italian too. I was born and raised Roman Catholic. Um, yeah. But for me, you know, science science is everything. Science doesn't really. There's always room to make adjustments with science. That, that's what science is all about. There's no right. absolution in science unless it is proven with mathematical numbers. So yes. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because that way we well, can go into uh, the next segment here. Um, one of the questions I did want to ask you, Mr. Cremo, um, is what really fascinates me, Mr. Cremo, are, are the Sumerians. You know, how could these ancient men, these brute-like savages in this small region, in the, what is it, the uh, Fertile Crescent, just they just magically created written language, astronomy, oh my god, I hit the mic, and uh, mathematics and so forth um was ancient man really that clever or did they get helped somehow some way what do you think mr cremo well all of the above you know they could have had help uh i mean the whole idea of religion is based on that you know that humanity needs help in understanding things so Sometimes God sends a representative or inspires someone. Uh, many of the early scientists, like uh, Newton, for example, was a very devoted religious person. You know, I don't think he was a Catholic. I think he was a uh, Protestant. But, but uh <clears throat> And God featured a lot in his work, if you look at all of his writings. And, you know, there was, uh, uh, there, there have been other scientists as well who have had a, a religious or spiritual inspiration for their work. You know, even Darwin, you know, who wrote about the theory of evolution? He he accepted that you know after you know, even in his his uh, book he wrote about how in the beginning God may create one or two uh, first living things and then from that then everything else unfolds. So. But in, in general, I regard myself as a person looking for the truth. And wherever I can find the truth, whether it's from some spiritual or religious source or from some scientific source, I, I just want the truth. You just want the truth. Is. Right. Understood. That's very reasonable. And uh, by the way, I'm curious if you have crossed paths um, with Eric Von Daniken at, at any time. I have. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure. It, it was kind of interesting because, you know, like after Forbidden Archaeology came right. out, I started getting invitations to speak at UFO conferences. Mm. And I kind of wondered, well, what's the connection between archaeology and UFOs? You know, you know I, I, think, I think what appeal to them was the knowledge filter aspect of what I was saying. That, you know, sometimes, you know, archaeologists and other scientists might find evidence for extreme human antiquity, but because it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't go along with the dominant theories in archaeology these days, it sort of gets filtered out. So I think the UFO researchers kind of experience the same thing. You know, that, yes, there's this evidence for UFOs. It comes from oftentimes very good sources, trained military pilots, radar operators, uh, police. Uh, it's quite uh, popular. Airline, it's quite pilots. popular these days now, Mr. Cremo, as it always has been, but I always had noticed there was like a cycle in terms of popularity and right now we are um, experiencing that cycle return again we are seeing ufos being talked about on all these popular media platforms now yeah so i so i i was invited by eric von daniken to speak at a conference he organized in switzerland nice Actually, richard thompson and i both were invited and we went you know, so, uh, you know, I, uh, and we would, I would speak at some of the same conferences as Eric von Daniken. And so, yeah, we did have a, 
uh, a relationship. A friendly rapport. I mean, not extensive, but yeah, he knew who I was. I knew who he was. And... Nice. Okay. And um, I must ask you, what exactly is your opinion on the very popular TV show, Ancient Aliens? Well, uh, I appeared in several of the initial episodes. You know, I was in the I appeared in what, what they called the pilot, you know, the very first shows that they showed on the History Channel. Right. And then I was involved, I was interviewed for several of the early seasons, first, second, third, and so on. At a certain point, they stopped inviting me, and I think that's because I was, I had, I was trying to get across an expanded conception of what it means to be an extraterrestrial because one which I regard one concept which I regard as too restrictive is that it just means other flesh and blood creatures from other planets in our solar system or some other solar system that come to Earth somehow and interact with the flesh and blood people on Earth. I expand the concept of extraterrestrial to include beings like angels, uh, gods, ultimately uh, a monotheistic god. You know, and, and to me, each one of us as a conscious spiritual being is also an extraterrestrial because uh, the soul that inhabits each body, as I see it, is not from this earth. It's from some other place, some other higher dimension of reality. So uh, I, I thought it, the series, I haven't seen all the recent seasons of it, but I, I originally thought it was a good idea and it kind of showed how the media had opened up. You know, back in the 1990s, when Mysterious Origins of Man came out, the, I mean, the, the broadcast networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, were practically, they had a, a stranglehold on, right. on you know, the visual media. But now there are just thousands and thousands of channels people can get, you know, so it's kind of opened up. And maybe the audience is smaller, but there is an opportunity to present these alternative ideas. So I think that's positive. I think so, too. And uh, by the way, before we finish up with uh, Egypt here, one man comes to mind, and that is Mr. Zahi Hawass, uh, depending on who you are. You might not have either liked him or you did like him. His sort of um, his reputation has always followed him. Um, what exactly is your? Do you have any uh, experience, any run-ins, or anything with Mr. Zahi Hawass, Mr. Cremo? Well, I think there are researchers like John Anthony West, Robert Muvall, Graham Hancock, and others who have kind of focused on the more recent history of humanity and human civilization. They're you know, going back over the past 50,000 years, let's say. My own research has been focused on the deeper history of the human race, going back tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years. So I haven't had a, a lot of, I haven't had any dealings, personal oh, okay. dealings with Sally Wasp. But those who are dealing like with, you know, trying, like Robert Schock, you know, trying to show that the Sphinx is maybe 11 or 12,000 years old rather than the five or 6,000 years old, most scientists now accept. Or people who are trying to show through the alignment of the uh, pyramids to the different constellations, yeah. that it's much older than they now think. Uh, the researchers who were dealing with that particular topic, they would have, I mean, I, 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 because I read all their books, and 
I stay in touch a little bit with what's going on, not just with my own work, but the work of others. I know secondhand, you could say, about uh, Mr. Hawass. Understood, understood. The antiquities, head of the antiquities Mm -hmm. department in, in Egypt. So anybody who wants to do any work in Egypt, any research, excavation, they've got to go through him. You got to go through him. And apparently sometimes there's difficulties. Very difficult. Uh, yes, sir. I, I have a cell phone number. I, I plan to bother him again very soon. We'll see how that works out. Um, <laughs> but yes, Robert Baval, great book. He has some great books on Orion's Belt. That's where you know, he talks about the alignment there. But furthermore, I forgot to ask you this question here. Uh, going back to what we were discussing here, um, what what do you think the possible motive could be for a scientist uh, for wanting to sort of keep this kind of evidence suppressed? What what would they have to gain for that, Mr. Cremo? Um, you know, it's this is something that that philosophers of science and historians of science have really looked into it. And what they find is that sometimes theoretical preconceptions can influence how scientists treat different categories of evidence that come to their attention. Because ultimately science, according to this point of view, is a social uh, activity. And you know, if you're educated, you go through an education system where the authority, the expert, tells you, this is our current state of knowledge, this is what the general consensus is now. And <clears throat> when you encounter things that are outside the consensus, you tend to think, well, that really doesn't fit in with science as I'm being taught it. Yeah, so that that's one answer to your question. Another answer to your question is <clears throat> that you know there there's power considerations. Um, if somebody has monopoly power, you know, in a certain situation, they don't want to give it up very easily. Like if one political party has a monopoly on the political life of a city or a county or a state or a nation, if they're in the majority, they want to keep the majority. They want to keep the monopoly on, on the, having access to the levers of power. And if one company has a monopoly in a certain sector of the economy. It wants to keep the competition out. It wants to keep its position of dominance. If one country has a monopoly on the position of military superpower, wants to keep its position, it wants to keep rivals down. So, It's just natural that if a a group has a monopoly, a government enforces a monopoly in the education system and scientific institutions, then it wants to keep its position in power. So I think it's something everyone can, can understand. And how how these groups treat their competitors who are in the minority, you know, that that is a very important question in democratic societies. Whether we're talking about minority opinions in science, minority political parties, minority ethnic groups, minority religions, uh, you know, it's, it's a question the fair treatment of minorities becomes a very important question in democracies. Right. Uh, Mike, were you going to say something there? No, no, no. Oh, I thought you were going to chime in here. 
No, I, I think I hit the microphone as well. Uh, Understood. Understood. My goodness, but yes, Mr. Cremo, um, you know, I could talk to you for another hour quite easily here. I'm not quite sure how much time you have left uh, to talk here. But, you know, well, we mm -hmm. we started at six thirty my time. Oh my! It's, what eight eight now? It's eight now. I can go another half hour. That would be two hours. Is that okay? That's fine with me. We could talk a little bit okay. more. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we so could... let's let's talk for another twenty five or thirty minutes. I have and to... then I'll have to wrap it up. Yes, sir. I have to ask you if I recall correctly, there was a discovery of hominins who were walking across a Greek island that was covered in volcano up. Uh, Volcanic ash, about what five point seven million years ago. What was that? Was that a legitimate story, Mister Cremo? What? Now, tell, tell me that one again. I didn't catch the first part. I had recalled there were some researchers who discovered hominins. They were walking across a Greek island that was covered in volcanic ash. About 5.7 million years ago, I had read about this. Uh, yes, that that mm -hmm. was uh, a story that came out, you know, like you said, uh, just a few years ago. Yes, sir. So I looked into that. I, I wrote about that case in uh, uh, <clears throat> a column that I wrote for Atlantis Rising magazine. I, I, I used to do a column. I did it for many years. It was called The Forbidden Archaeologist. So when that news came out, I kind of wrote a column about it. Now, the interesting thing about the footprints that the scientists found in Oh, the that's what you're talking cash, about. Oh, okay. Uh, I remember that. <laughs> they, <laughs> Sorry, they I were, just got excited. <laughs> some of them Appeared to be human in in shape, so that's what drew my attention to it. That you know you couldn't really say. I mean, without having the skeletal remains, I mean, you could say, well, maybe there was some kind of hominin human ancestor that uh, had feet. Pretty much like modern human feet, uh, but uh, you know, I think that possibility had to be considered. It's pretty wild. So I, that's that's what attracted me to that uh, particular case. Oh yes, and not to uh, forget the mention of the Palexi River out in uh, Texas. Another yeah, very well, interesting uh, case of a human footprint, by the way that was found there mike and it was discovered close by a dinosaur uh, sort of print i remember that yeah too. i had heard about that case but i did not include it in forbidden archaeology because the main scientist dr henry morris <clears throat> jr i think he was a christian creationist a scientist and researcher he he was the main one who was promoting those cases. But at a certain point, he wrote a letter to a scientific journal called Nature, which is regarded by many scientists as one of the world's leading scientific publications. He wrote a letter to Nature saying that he renounced his own previous opinion. Mm, I see. He thought the footprint was not that of a human being, but it was a dinosaur footprint that had been eroded so that it looked like a human footprint. So on that basis, I didn't include it in my book, Forbidden Archaeology. But since that time, you know, uh, a student of archaeology, a graduate student of archaeology in Texas, had gotten in touch with me and said the students liked you know, the book Forbidden Archaeology and asked if uh, she, it was a lady, if she could do anything in Texas to help with my research. And I told her, you can go to that uh, Paluxy place yeah. and have a look around there and tell me what you think 
as an archaeologist about those alleged footprints. Hmm. So she went there, and during the time she was there, they were doing some new excavation uh, at the dinosaur uh, track site. And, you know, they were uh, breaking up layers of rock, you know, to clear off a, a new surface. And when they did that, they found uh, new human-like prints next to the dinosaur prints. And this archaeology student that went up there and visited, she reported back to me, they looked like they're human to me. And she sent, sent me a lot of documentation. So I'm going to be dealing with that case in, in uh, my new book, which should be out later this year. Nice. Extreme Human Antiquity. Okay. So... Uh, I didn't even know you had a new book coming out, Michael. Yeah. Like I said, because of being confined to one place, oh, yeah. I've <laughs> been able to finish up you know, some projects that I probably should have finished up a long time ago. Yeah. That's one of the pluses. Get distracted. Get yeah. distracted by... <laughs> My life. I think we've all, think we've all, we've all had uh, the opportunities to clean out all our closets, drawers, finish projects we haven't, I mean, that we put off for years uh, with this last year of, of uh, being in solitude. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've kind of turned that book over, being edited. I'll have to select illustrations for it, you know, pictures and, but, Manuscript is done. It should be out later this year. Will you be mentioning any anything about the Vedic texts by any chance? Uh, not in that book. Uh, other than to say that they were the inspiration for it, because uh, basically what I do in that type of book is I explain, you know, you, you can't, I can't expect archaeologists and other scientists to accept the statement from the Vedas as evidence of any kind. No, of course but not. What I yeah. can do, what I can do is I can make a hypothesis. Mm. If what is explained in the Vedic text about human history is true, then we should expect to find reports of scientists discovering evidence for humans who existed millions of years ago. And I show that such reports are there and leave it up to whoever reads the book to make up their mind about them. But there are other books that I've written like Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory, in which I do go more into the Vedic uh, teachings uh, as a, a background to the research that I did on, on those books, which deal more with the idea of that a human being is not just a machine made of molecules, but is composed of Yes, a, a gross material body made of chemical elements, but beyond that, a subtle mental body with some very unusual powers. Some would call them paranormal powers, like remote viewing and things like that. And then beyond that, there's a conscious self. You could call it the soul if you're going to use uh, religious terminology. But I. I tend to call it a conscious self that is the essential, most essential part of our being. So uh, it's more about consciousness and the mind and things like that. Right. And as soon as you said that, Mr. Cremo, I instantly remembered why exactly I, I even mentioned a Russian, by the way. The reason why I mentioned... A Russian earlier to you in, in this conversation was uh, due to the fact that the 
the so the the um, Russians out there during the 1970s, the Soviet, you know, they were heavily into uh, mind readers of sorts, psychic spies. Yeah, America was too. Oh yes, uh, the uh, CIA and the military agencies contracted with organizations like Stanford Research Institute, where you had. Uh, people like Stefan Schwartz and others who were involved in running uh, remote viewing projects for ESP. United right. States intelligence. Services. ESP, Mike. Um, I, I, I yes. saw a program on, on that once uh, where they had hired, the Americans had hired uh, psychics with ESP to uh, try to solve some crimes as well as uh, trying to even win some wars, I believe. Right. Um, Project Stargate, Mike. Is that what it was? Yeah, from like 72 to yep. probably early 90s is when they disbanded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, I'm, that's, I'm that's, admitted. that's what they've admitted to. Mm hmm. Interesting stuff, to, to be honest. And uh, by the way, just a quick question here a very curious question for you. Uh, Mr. Cremo, just, you know, just if you have to take a guess, you know, with the institutional archaeology so based against, you know, these alternative points of view, how do you think you've become so successful, Mr. Cremo, in your opinion, through your books and your lectures? Well, within archaeology and anthropology and other differences, there are two influences at work. One comes from philosophy called positivism, which meant that, okay, there's matter operating according to uh, material laws which can be discovered by science. And uh, on that basis, we come to certain conclusions and there's uh, about an independently existing past. And they, 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 they're influential, but they're not uh, totally alone. There's another group that's influenced by, by what we can broadly call postmodern ideas, which uh, emphasize that, well, we, we don't have direct access to the real existing past. Uh, we're always approaching the past based on our present society, our present ideas, our present biases, and things like that, which means that there might be, and there can be, and there are multiple views of the past. And, you, you know, that. That is uh, a dominant, or you'd say subdominant, group among among uh, archaeologists and anthropologists, and it also extends to other uh, uh, another aspect of of these things is that many archaeologists understand that their discipline was used during the colonial period to suppress alternative, other worldviews in Asia, Africa, everywhere, South America, North America. So, so there's uh, a recognition that different wisdom traditions in different parts of the world, they may have a different concept of the past. And this gets into, like, respect for indigenous people, their views of the past, like the Australian Aboriginals, the Native American Indians, Pacific Islanders. In, in other words, there's a group within archaeology that is willing to consider alternative ideas with roots and other cultures. I see. You know, so I would say because 
of that element. And I think another thing is is that uh, a lot of researchers really don't try to deal with the mainstream scientific community, whether they're historians or anthropologists or archaeologists. Uh, I have tried to stay in touch with them. So I, you know, I don't compromise my ideas, but I think I have studied and tried to put things in terms that they understand in terms of their discipline. And therefore, uh, I've been welcome to make presentations at their professional gatherings, and they review my books, uh, not always giving positive work, but saying, well, yeah, there's something to be considered here, something we should be open to. So, so I think for that reason, uh, I've been able to get some access. But what I try to do is stay in touch with all the groups that are interested in these questions related to our human identity because whoever controls the concept of identity actually is able to control the values, the objectives, the uh, goals that a person has. You know, for example, if I'm convinced I'm an American man, then I behave like that. You know, it's, so uh, I try to stay in touch with all of the groups, you know, the scientific community, the alternative science world, the paranormal researchers, the UFO, alien, extraterrestrial groups, spiritual and religious groups. I try to stay in touch with all yeah. of them. You try to stay on top, because no doubt. They're all part of the negotiation, renegotiation of our uh, picture of who we are, where we are, and where we should be going. Yes, I'm with you on that. And going back to the Vedic texts, I was just uh, curious to ask you, um, you know, we, we could spend another hour easily talking about that. Uh, Mike, I know you're not ready for another hour of that. Well, I, no I've got to get up early tomorrow morning for <laughs> yes. a, a Zoom meeting. Yes, sir. Um, yes, I, I was just going to finish up this interview with you and thank you tremendously for being a part of the program here, Mr. Cremo. If you feel like we have left uh, no stone unturned, definitely um, plug anything you'd like, Mr. Cremo. Well, if, if you feel that there are some stones that we haven't turned over, then you know you can get in touch with my publicist, who I think you've been in touch with, Lori. Lori, yes. And whenever you think it's appropriate, you know, and we can continue the discussion. Yes, sir. I would love to have you back.